Coming up next, the major Democratic candidates for governor debate the top issues facing North Carolina. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. Hello, I'm Kelly McCullen, and welcome to the Democratic gubernatorial candidates debate for the next hour. The major Democratic candidates for governor will discuss the issues facing North Carolina. Here's how our debate will work tonight. Each candidate receives one minute and 30 seconds for an opening statement and one minute at the debate's conclusion for closing statements. Each candidate will receive equal time to answer a series of questions, and if any candidate should exceed the allotted answer time, I must interrupt them to advance our discussion. The candidates will answer questions in a rotating alphabetical order. Each candidate can offer a 30-second rebuttal up to three times during the debate. We invited the three Democratic candidates with significant statewide campaigns to participate in this debate tonight. Mr. Walter Dalton is an attorney, a former six-term North Carolina state senator, and is currently North Carolina's lieutenant governor. Bob Etheridge is a former North Carolina House member, state superintendent of public instruction, and served as a U.S. congressman in North Carolina's 2nd Congressional District. Bill Faison is a practicing attorney and current member of the North Carolina House of Representatives. He has served District 50 since 2004. Let's start with opening statements. A drawing prior to this debate determined the order of the opening and closing statements. We'll start tonight with Mr. Walter Dalton. Kelly, thank you, and I look forward to your questions. And I want to thank the people of North Carolina for allowing me the honor to serve as your lieutenant governor. For the last three years, Pat McCrory has been traveling the state campaigning for governor. For the last three years, I've been traveling the state working for you, helping our people get through the tough times, working with small business to help create a small business loan fund to help them weather the storm, working on innovative programs for our public schools, expanding early colleges, aligning that effort with the job needs of the future. This election presents a very stark contrast. Pat McCrory and the Republican leadership are cutting teachers. They're trying to freeze economic development money. They're focused on divisive social issues. All of those things move North Carolina backwards. I want to move North Carolina forward. I want to work with you to lead North Carolina to a better day. I have a plan to create jobs now and jobs for the future and to modernize our economy. I, have, I am the candidate with the experience, the knowledge, the vision that can beat Pat McCrory, but more importantly, move North Carolina forward. Thank you, Mr. Dalton. Mr. Bob Etheridge. Kelly, thank you, and let me thank those who are tuning in this evening for being with us. I'm Bob Etheridge, and I'm running for governor because, let me tell you folks, you know, public education empowered a poor farm boy from eastern North Carolina to literally live, live the American dream. My dad and my mother neither finished high school. They were tenant farmers. But today that dream's in jeopardy. It's in jeopardy right here in North Carolina. Uh, you know, my most important job as governor is going to be to get funding put back in place for our institu educational institutions, for our pre-kindergarten, for our K-12, for our community college who train and retrain workers, for our universities that are struggling right now. Unfortunately, the Republican-led legislature doesn't see it that way. They have committed this last session to slashing funding for the institutions that make a difference in the state to help build our future. Tonight, I look forward to your questions our conversations of how we're going to rebuild our commitment to quality education that will build a foundation providing the jobs of the 21st century. <clears throat> I commit to you that quality education is important to having quality jobs for the 21st century. Thank you, Mr. Etheridge. Mr. Bill Faison. Good evening, folks. Thank you for allowing me to come into your home and talk with you tonight, and thanks to WNC for putting this on. We have a jobs crisis in North Carolina. We have more people unemployed than all but three other states. Over 472,000 people are unemployed. 
Uh, last month, 50,000 people newly filed for unemployment. We have an unemployment rate that's at 10 percent, unless you're African American, and then it's double that. As your governor, I'll provide leadership on jobs and the economy. I grew up on a North Carolina family farm, worked my way through college and law school. I have three children in North Carolina colleges now and one still at home with me in high school. I am the only candidate you will hear from tonight who has a jobs plan. And as your governor, I'll provide leadership on jobs. Um, as your governor, my job is to put back to work the 36,000 people who were fired by the Republican budget and to deal with the jobs crisis. Yeah, we need leadership with a vision and a plan. You know, in North Carolina, we have to have a smart tax policy. Uh, we have to have one that will promote new jobs, uh, one that will protect your drinking water from fracking, and we need to have an educational plan that will lead to jobs. I'm looking to talk with you about that tonight. Thank you, Mr. Face, and direct to the question, Mr. Dalton. Number one, you're in the leadoff slot. The facts are all three of you support some sort of a state sales tax increase. Yourself and Mr. Etheridge support three quarters of one penny to boost public education, maybe hire some teachers. Mr. Faison's jobs plan calls for 8.7 tenths percent tax increase on the sales tax rate for public sector job hiring and getting some jobs created. But we look at the private sector, we look at folks out of work. Unemployment is high, times are hard for many families. If those families, as well as all the rest of us, are going to pay that higher sales tax rate under these proposals, and they're not going to get one of those jobs that new revenue is going to create, which of these three plans provides the best yield or dividend on that investment? Well, Kelly, first, let me clarify. I, I am for the three-quarter penny sales tax, but what I am against are those cuts to education. If you look at Wake Tech today, there are a thousand students waiting to get into the nursing program, and the shame of it is there are jobs in nursing today, so we can retrain our workers and have them ready for the workforce. Those cuts to education were undue cuts. Remember, this is an extension of a tax that was already there and that the people were paying, and it's a, an extension of only three-quarters of that tax. That tax was put there to, quote, get us through the tough times. As I travel the state of North Carolina, what I am finding out is we're not through the tough times yet. So I think it's absolutely appropriate to protect our present, but also protect our future with those, that investment in education. Mr. Etheridge. Well, they shouldn't have taken it off to start with, Kelly, because now we see the results of that. Uh, we're having teachers laid off, and there's, the Republicans in the General Assembly said, oh, but we didn't do that. We haven't seen the cuts. They put together a budget that's just a trickster's budget. Because what they did, they sent the money out and said, you got to send this much back at the end of the year, which is roughly a half a billion dollars. And in the community colleges, they're cramped. They don't have the space. You can't train and retrain. I was in Brunswick County last Thursday night. They're concerned about having the resources to put people in the community college to train for the jobs that they so badly need. Our universities are having professors leave and take major grants with them. That is a result of failure to underfund our economic future. You fund it in tough times, so when you start to come out of this recession, good things happen. And we've historically done that in this state, and this was a huge mistake this year, in my opinion. Mr. Faison. Uh, yesterday morning, I stopped by the convenience store to get gas, and I was talking with the lady behind the counter who told me that two years ago, she lost her job that was paying her $42,000 a year. In the meantime, she's hunted for jobs but hasn't been able to find one. She's been working part-time at the convenience store. She finally found a job that's going to pay her $26,000 a year. She's taking a $16,000 a year hit. Now, folks, there are lots of people out there in that situation. We've got to help people get back to work. The plan I have is sort of like the fishes and loaves, you know, people helping each other. It allows us to use government to collect a fractional penny sales tax seven cents on a ten dollar purchase and then redistribute that so that we can hire back all the teachers, teachers aides, other state employees and private sector folks who lost their jobs as a result of the Republican budget cut. I wouldn't stop there though. I'd have a smart tax policy that helps small business people and I wouldn't stop there either. You know the state through its universities has a significant ownership in patents. We can use those 
to bring high-tech manufacturing back to rural North Carolina, and we need to do it. Thank you, Mr. Faison. Mr. Etheridge, following that line on the sales tax, every North Carolinian will pay the sales tax that does any shopping, no matter what your income level is. But 15.5% of our population lives below the poverty line, according to the U.S. Census. How do you justify a sales tax increase on those poorest of our citizens? I think it's a great question. And in that case, the General Assembly and the state ought to give them an earned income tax credit they can file for once they pay the tax. I think it's the only fair way to do because otherwise you're taxing in a disproportionate way the poorest of the poor in this state. And that'd be unfair. But certainly we need the resources and we ought to do it so they can pay. But let me just uh, add one point to that because, uh, you know, we talked about the cost. Pat McCrory on this very TV station said that it really was the reason tuition went up at our universities was the fault of the students and the universities. Last time I checked, it was the General Assembly that did that. They cut the funds, and it has doubled tuition and fees for the students in our universities in the last 10 years. That's unacceptable. We cannot continue to do that if we're going to be a prosperous state and move forward. That is just not acceptable in North Carolina. We need to read the North Carolina Constitution that says tuition shall be as low as practical. That's how we fund economic growth for the long run in, in North Carolina. Mr. Faison. Well, um, I don't know whether everybody knows it or not, but 65% of our regular C-Corps don't pay any income tax in this state. And while the Republicans were taking us to the floor in educational spending per pupil this last session, they were giving tax breaks to multi-state corporations, not our local folks, not the small business people. They put another $38 million of tax burden on the rest of us by giving a break to the big corporations. Well, if they can give a break to the big corporations, the least they can do is give an earned income tax credit to the poorest of folks who are challenged by the economic condition we're in. When I go to the small rural country stores and talk with people, folks tell me they think the sales tax is the fairest tax because everybody pays it. No matter who they are, no matter how wealthy they are, they pay it. And that would apply to the corporations too. These folks ought to be sharing their portion of the responsibility to help us educate our children and help us provide for folks within our society. Mr. Dalton. Kelly, in North Carolina, we do have an earned income tax credit. I supported that, and I hope people will use it. Too many people do not know about it. They need to access that. But when you're talking about people in poverty, the avenue out of poverty is education for themselves and for their children. These are the people probably that need the retraining the most, and their children need that opportunity. This budget that the Republicans passed cut Smart Start by 20%. That is a program that helps children be ready to learn. It cut overall education. It cut the community colleges and hurt us on retraining, as I said before. So that investment in education, I think, ultimately does benefit those people that perhaps are hurting the most. Mr. Ethers, 30 seconds. Well, I agree with Lieutenant Governor to a point. Education is the key up. I've been doing that all my whole life. That's where I came from. It would have been a whole lot more helpful if we'd heard more out of him over the last couple of years when the General Assembly was making those cuts, when he was silent on those issues and everybody else was fighting for it, those are the times when you need to speak up is when action is being taken, not after the fact. Mr. Faison, the U.S. House of Representatives passed a 2003 trade deal between the U.S., Chile, and Singapore. Then Congressman Etheridge voted yes in favor of that bill. Mr. Dalton recently said on the campaign stump that was a bad deal. It cost North Carolinians their jobs. In between all that, how can North Carolina remain globally competitive? We hear about that. While avoiding all the economic side effects you hear about, like outsourcing, and still create the in-state jobs we need. Well, yeah, I agree. We've had a misguided Congress. And I agree that Congressman Etheridge has made some bad votes that have hurt us and sent our jobs overseas. And in, in part may explain why he has no jobs plan and doesn't discuss one here because the only plan he's had up to now is to send the jobs to some other place. But what we need to look at is the fact that our state universities are the seventh leading owner of patents nationwide. There have been many a business created off of a single patent. We're not going to get textile manufacturing back. China and Singapore and other places have it. And we're not going to get 
furniture manufacturing back, that too has gone away. But we've got to have manufacturing in rural North Carolina to support our people. They are hurting. And what we need to do is look at the value in those state patents, marry them up with entrepreneurs, use the business incubator systems that we already have in place through our universities, our community colleges, and the rural centers to start businesses in rural North Carolina and put people back to work. Mr. Dalton. Kelly, first of all, Bob hasn't been following me around. I have been speaking up about the bad things in this budget. But I'm from a hometown that saw 17% unemployment. When I was asked why did that happen, I investigated and I found out there were these trade bills. Little did I know that when I got into this race that Bobby had voted with Bush on that and was the only Democrat in North Carolina to do that. It sent our jobs overseas. It hurt our farmers. Our exports have gone down. We are still getting back to our knees because of that vote. And we're struggling with this economy because of that. Mr. Etheridge. You know, Mr. Dalton talks, but he needs to check his facts. On the trade treaty he's talking about, our trade increased by $28 billion in the United States. It's 68 percent in exports in those areas. And it, if, you know, if he, if he just look at it, those people east of I-95, the agriculture sector is the number one industry in North Carolina. Pork, poultry, potatoes. You go down the list, tobacco, but it also affected folks here in the Triangle and up west for, te for uh, telecommunications, for uh, those folks in the industry of providing technology, for our banking industry. So North Carolina was a major benefactor. Yes, there are jobs lost in trade treaties, but there are, there are also jobs won and jobs benefited, and there, that's why we held out to make sure that through the Commerce Act, we put in training and retraining for it, the very thing the lieutenant governor talks about, that the state spends, those are federal dollars that come here to be spent for it. Mr. Faison, 30 seconds. Bob, those jobs you're talking about are some other state. We're worse off than all but three states in this union. Now, maybe he got some jobs, but he didn't bring them home. He sent them somewhere else. You go down to East North Carolina and talk to the folks down there, they'll tell you they're out of work. And Walter, you need to check your numbers. Your local community just didn't see 17% unemployment. You have 15% unemployment today, and you're not doing anything to fix it and haven't been fighting this issue with me. Next question, Mr. Dalton. Most Democratic lawmakers say it's that Republican state budget that they pass is costing public educators their jobs. Republicans say many of those jobs were the eliminations of vacant positions. You're on the record, you don't like the way the Republicans have handled the budget in public education. But if voters buy into your prescription, to your proposals, how do they know they're going to get higher classroom achievement because of it? First of all, let me go back because Bob was defending that trade vote. He was quoting USA Farm Statistics. Go to the North Carolina Department of Commerce and you will find North Carolina exportations to those countries went down. Also, he talked about there was things in the, that bill for the banking industry, and that's where a lot of that benefit went. As far as vacant positions, there were a net 900 and something teachers lost in this, over 5,000 educators lost in this budget. There are more that are going to be lost. What we need to do is use that three-quarter penny sales tax, repair a lot of that, but we also have to use technology more efficient, efficiently in the classroom. We need to customize learning more. Kids that are falling behind, we have software programs now that can identify that early, catch them up, and move our gifted and talented at a much more rapid rate. Mr. Etheridge. Mr. Dalton is selective in his facts. He needs to get them deep. And the truth is, as Lieutenant Governor, he needs to show up and vote on those boards and commissions that he's a part of. Now, let me talk about funding, because the truth is, when you underfund and you don't fund education first, and this last General Assembly had a chance to do that, and they chose not to do that, they chose to, to mo walk down the road of doing away with our future, and now we're seeing it, and come this fall, you're going to see about $290 million, roughly, $89, $90 million of federal funds is going to go away, plus the return of the trickster money they're taking back 
You're going to see a lot of teachers be lost this fall. You're going to see a lot of classrooms with increased, increased class size. And I think it will <coughs> impair the economic future of this state. North Carolina has been known as a state that people look to for education excellence and a dynamo for jobs. We're going to get back to it when we start investing in public education again. Then we create those jobs here in North Carolina. Mr. Faison. I think both of these guys are running for superintendent of public instruction. And while they're at it, they ought to go talk to the superintendent we already have. She says that this year we graduated more students than any time in the past, that our teachers are doing a phenomenal job, even though challenged economically. You know, they've got the cart before the horse. Folks, when our kids get an education, they're getting it so they can get a job. When you get an education, whether it's the community college system or at a university, you're getting it so you can get a job. The News and Observer reported that we haven't had any job growth in this state. That is, the job growth, if we got a job, we lost a job, and it's been flat for the last 12 years. We need to get about the business of providing jobs for people in this state. And then once we have the jobs in, we can then know what the education or additional education needs to look like to serve those jobs. These guys want to go have an education and then hope a job is going to show up. It works the other way around. We go get the job, and then we educate people to service that job so they'll be employed. Mr. Etheridge, university system students are going to face an average 8.8% tuition hike really, really soon, and many will be leaving college with that degree and a mountain of student loan debt to repay. That's the 21st century. We hear about these visions of the 21st century. If you're a policymaker, what should that be regarding higher ed? More importantly, if you're a family, what should your 21st century vision be for higher education? Thank you. And uh, Mr. Faison's point of you, you, you get the job before you get the education. I hope we don't do that because it'll be a long time getting those jobs. You got to educate people for the jobs before you bring them. But let me tell you something. The average college student in North Carolina, and I got these numbers from UNC the other day from the dean of the School of Business, is leaving college with $28,000 in debt. That's the average. A lot have no debt. That being the case, how do you choose to be a teacher or a police officer or be in the public service sector? Now, the federal government has helped with providing Pell Grants and other things, but we need to read our state constitution where it says tuition shall be as low as practical. And I mentioned earlier, that in North Carolina in the last 10 years, just in the last 10 years, tuition and fees at our public universities have doubled. That means for a student going in, they're gonna come out with a huge debt. That is a huge challenge. Now, why is that so, such a big problem? Number one, they can't choose the job they'd like to have in many cases. The second one is, if they get in trouble, and I hope they don't do this, but we're gonna file bankruptcy, that debt does not go away. It follows them right on. So for a lot of folks, that means they, they have to make a decision to get married, a car, a host of other things. That has to change and the state's got to meet, meet their obligation in that regard. Mr. Faison. Well, the facts that Bob puts forward illustrate part of the problem. If you're coming out of college with a debt of $28,000 on the average, you've got to have a college educated job if you have any hope of paying that back. And yet, roughly 50% of young folks are coming out of college now and having to take a job not only not in their field, but a job that does not require a college education. And you can't pay back a college education loan with a job that doesn't require a college education. Our government's not working for us as it needs to. We need to have a government focused on jobs and the economy. And what my opponents are saying to you tonight illustrates the problem. They've gotten caught in the ditch somewhere. Education is vitally important, but you must have the job to use that education on. That's why you're going to school, is to get the education so you can hopefully do a job you'd like to do. But if you don't have a job, then you don't get to do it. So what we've got to do is focus on jobs in the economy. I've been doing that for the last six months. I didn't see either one of them around trying to help until they ended up filing for office. And even then, it took one of them until this week to come up with a jobs plan. The other one hadn't got one yet. Mr. Dalton. 
Kelly, two things I would point out. One, I think it highlights the difference between the way the Democrats handled the budget and the way the Republicans have handled it this past year. Whenever there were increases in tuition during the last eight years or before the Republicans came into power, you always saw financial aid go up. In fact, you will see a greater increase in financial aid, I believe, than you would see increases in tuition, trying to hold those uh, that were need-based harmless. What you saw this time was an increase in tuition and a decrease in financial aid, which is a horrible formula. Now, talking about what do we do in education, we have to change the way we educate. I had very, a lot to do with the establishment of the early colleges in North Carolina. I'm proud of that. It is a model. But it's a five-year program, a collaboration between public schools and institutions of higher learning. And in five years, entering the ninth grade, you will have two years of college or a technical degree. And the parents have that free of cost. That is a good model. Then they can go on and get their last two, and it makes college far more affordable. Mr. Faze and geologists say North Carolina could possess... 40 years of natural gas deposits at the state's current burn rate, no pun intended on that burn rate, but if fracking is allowed, it could open up some real economic opportunities for this state and some local counties. It could also introduce some potential environmental risk as well as governor. How do you weigh that risk versus all that economic gain potential that could be achieved through natural gas exploration? Folks, just so you understand, fracking is where you take perfectly good drinking water, you intentionally contaminate it, you ram it down in the ground, you break up the substructure of the earth, you don't know where that contaminated water is going, what you can get of it you bring back up and stick in an injection well, you're using up about three million gallons of fresh water every five days of fracking in a state that has a tremendous drought problem. You know, the, the Department of Natural Resources has done a study. What they found is that if we even had fracking, it only means 59 jobs in the first year. Over the average, you could only hope to get about, I don't know, less than 400 jobs. And most of those would go to folks out of state because you've only got about 200 folks inside the state who know how to frack. And all of the material that you need for fracking is already manufactured somewhere else. There are reserves in other places, so it'll be at least a decade before you get around to it in North Carolina. The Republicans did a bill where they put a half a billion dollars in the bill for well damage because they intend to mess up your drinking water. Now, I stood up on the floor of the House and argued against fracking. I voted against fracking. I've spoken out against fracking. And as your governor, I'll protect your drinking water from fracking. Mr. Dalton. Kelly, you know, if it creates a ton of jobs, if it helps get us off foreign energy, if it doesn't damage our water, if it doesn't create earthquakes, you know, I think you perhaps embrace it. But those are a lot of ifs. And that's the reason I've said that we need more study on this. Certainly, if North Carolina considers ever doing that, we need to have regulations in place that make sure that our drinking water is not damaged. What I understand is the geology of North Carolina is different from some of these other states. Our shelves of shale are closer to the water table. We need to be careful about that. Parts of North Carolina are on a fault line. Fracking can go as deep as four miles into the earth. We need more study. We need to be cautious about this before we ever proceed. Mr. Etheridge. Kelly, before we move, we need, we need more science. We need more study. I agree with that. The fact is that in addition to the damage it could do to our drinking water, to our agricultural lands, the, the water that goes on our land, we also have a nuclear power plant not far from here that's sitting pretty close to a fault line. And I don't think any of us want to do anything that creates anything that would put that in jeopardy. So I think there's more study needs to be, be done. We need to know a lot more before we move forward. And it's going to require the General Assembly, in my view, to take a longer look at it. And the next governor is going to have to view that uh, in a way that it does not do any harm. It's sort of like the doctor's issues do no harm. I think we have to do the same thing. If we can get the energy and provide the jobs without that, I think we all would agree that's something we should do, but we've got to make sure we don't do any harm. Mr. Dalton, the U.S. Supreme Court will be deciding the fate of the Affordable Care Act health care reform. Uh, that could be next month, but this month it's an issue for North Carolina. You could see a share of Medicaid costs rise over $1 billion a year in the next governor's first term. If this economy doesn't get going to produce enough 
tax revenue organically. Where do we find the money to cover the mandated health care services we'll be required as North Carolinians to supply to each other? Well, as you said, it's in the court system now and the Congress will still be in session. And that is not a perfect bill and some of these issues need to be addressed by the Congress. But I will tell you this, we have a national health care plan now and it is called the emergency room. If anybody has a health problem, they end up in the emergency room. And it is the most expensive dollar in health care today. And a lot of that emergency room care is never paid for by the patient. And the rest of us end up paying for that. So I applaud the fact that the Congress took that on and tried to solve the problem. Have they fully solved the problem? I don't think so, but I don't think you throw the bill away. I think you work on it. People I talk to like the idea that they can keep their children on their policy until they're age 26. They like the idea that a pre-existing condition will not kick them out of health coverage. But it is not a perfect bill. There's cost to small business that I don't like, and I would like to see the Congress go back in and begin to address that rather than to make it a political football. Mr. Etheridge. Well, Kelly, as you know, I voted for it. Uh, my opponents last time used that as one of the issues. I think they were wrong. I think history will prove that. I don't know what the courts are going to do. Lord knows no one knows what this court will do anyway. But the point is that if you have a child who has a pre-existing condition before this bill passed, you up the creek. There's no health care. You're on your own. And if they throw this out, they're saying to the American people, you're on your own all over again. We're not here with any safety net. And yes, it was a way to say to the average citizen. Matter of fact, this was the same bill that the Republicans wanted. They absolutely wanted it. As soon as President Obama put it in, they said, oh, no, we don't want that because you put it in. Well, I was proud to stand with President Obama and vote for it. A lot of folks and a lot of them in my party took a walk. I think they were wrong in it because I really think it is not right for a person not to have health care if you've got a baby that's sick. And I heard from, from mothers, I heard from nurses who were so tired of not being able to help people because they didn't have health care, one in Sanford. This bill was right. I think it's the right thing to do. And I'd be surprised if the Supreme Court really turns it over and, and uh, rules it unconstitutional. Mr. Faison. Of course, I'm not a lawyer. President Obama has shown great leadership to step up and try to deal with the health care crisis within our country. Uh, we have a health care problem. There are people in our communities who are having to make choices between health care and food. It should not be that way. And so it's a good thing that we have the leadership at the national level. Is it a perfect bill? No, not by any stretch of the imagination. Now, are, are there problems that need to be addressed? Yes, there are. But you know, sometimes the solution lies some other place. I uh, heard recently from a small business that was having trouble with people being out of work. And they had trouble because their health insurance was just about to put them under. And so what they did is bring in a nurse whose job it was to help folks get healthier. And she met with the people in the business, showed them how to uh, eat better, have a little exercise. They lost on the average about 30 pounds, believe it or not. And as a result of losing the weight, becoming healthier, their absenteeism went down, their production with the company went up, their personal sense of how they felt about their body and themselves improved, their happiness improved, and uh, they just did better all the way around, and the health care cost in this business went down dramatically. Said differently, we need to look at simple, practical solutions that can save us money, and as your governor, that's going to be part of my goal. Mr. Ethers, Trayvon Martins, fatal shooting down in Florida has brought some renewed attention to self-defense laws where lethal force is authorized and legalized. North Carolina's law includes some self-defense provisions uh, similar to Florida's statute being cited in the Martin case. How much do you trust otherwise diligent, responsible gun owners during that split-second decision? And is it time to revisit these laws in North Carolina? Well, certainly as soon as that happened, I, I, I was asked that question at a forum. And I said that in that case, they should get the information, take it to the, to the grand jury and take action. They didn't. The attorney general intervened and has now moved. Uh, certainly, you know, I, I, I really agree with people's Second Amendment rights to a point. When I was state superintendent, 
We got legislation passed to give a perimeter around a public school to have protection. And now we're doing it where this, these general assemblies now are going in and saying, well, you can carry them in parks. You can carry them any place where children are. You know, that's never the intent. Last time I checked, if you're in a park with your child, there's not much likelihood of being able to have a real problem there. Uh, there's no need to be carrying weapons. I think North Carolina probably ought to relook at it, revisit it, uh, because I think that as you look at these pieces, it's very easy for someone in the heat of the moment, when their tempers flare, to make a mistake, they'll regret the rest of their life and a lot of us have seen that in Westerns over the years, and we don't need the Wild West here again. Mr. Faison. Trayvon Martin case is a very tragic situation. And it's tragic because a young man lost his life, but it's also tragic because it illustrates that racism still exists. The thing that is an underlying problem, not just in Florida, but a problem we have to continue dealing with in this state. Fortunately, in North Carolina, we do not have a law like Florida's, and that's a good thing. Unfortunately, in North Carolina, we have a Republican legislature that tried this last time around to make it legal to conceal carry into a restaurant bar. Now, folks, bars and guns don't go well together, and I say that with my sons and I being hunters and enjoy hunting and enjoy being outside. But the Republican legislature that we've got over there has just not got its head in the right place. Why, do you know they tried to make it legal to carry a concealed handgun onto school grounds and to a parade? Those people are in a different place. And you know what y'all need to do? You need to replace them with Democrats who'll use some good sense in the House. Mr. Dalton. There are many responsible gun owners. Perhaps most of them are very responsible, but I agree with what has been said. It's always been the common law that you can defend within your home, but outside of the home, in bars and parks, that, that is not the place to allow that. And I think Trayvon Martin, if any good could come out of that, and very little can. It's a very tragic circumstance. But it does teach the lesson of what can happen when someone you know, sees reckless endangerment. That gentleman was told by 911, do not go after that person. Stay where you are, let the police handle it. Yet, he took it on his own, and it, he saw what happened. So I think there's a lesson to be learned there. What the common law was, I think, is probably a good rule. But to go beyond that to bars and to restaurants is ludicrous. Mr. Faison, let's assume North Carolina's House and Senate maintains its strong, maybe veto-proof majorities. Rhetoric aside, the red meat aside of a primary battle, if you're a governor, how are you going to get your job done working with Republican leadership? Well, I want you to uh, realize that up until this year that most legislation went through the legislature with bipartisan support. And in fact, you might see three to five pieces of uh, partisan legislation a long session. This session, we saw that many pieces of partisan, radical, social agenda, Republican bills a week. And so the problem is their social agenda. As long as the, the, what I find is that most people can get together around a common sense approach to dealing with a common sense problem. Our problems are to educate our children, provide prisons for folks who would harm the rest of us, provide Medicaid for folks who can't otherwise afford it, and otherwise provide the services that government provides to you. Now, I think there are enough people of goodwill over at the legislature that as long as we stay away from their radical social agenda, we can build a consensus around things that will help people in this state, that will build jobs in this state, that will save people their houses and their cars and help them educate their kids, and we'll be able to work together. Mr. Dalton. I think the best thing is to have great ideas and good vision, and then get them to the table and show them how good that idea is or that vision is. If there are problems, let's identify the problems. Let's put ideology aside for a moment, and let's see if we can agree on one thing. What are the problems? Now let's see if we can agree on how we can fix them. I've had a history of working bipartisan in the uh, legislature. The Jobs Commission, which I chair, 
joining our businesses and schools, taking the early colleges and aligning those with business needs, was supported by both Democrats and Republicans in a Democratic legislature and in a Republican legislature. We passed nine pieces of legislation. Bill voted for every one of them, I think. And But the reason it passed, it is good stuff that is helping our schools. We talked about the dropout rate. Seven of the top ten high schools last year with the lowest dropout rate were at the early colleges. So good ideas help. And encouraging them to put ideology aside. If that doesn't work, then you take your case to the people and convince them that they need to put pressure on their legislators. I will be a hands-on governor. I will be working directly with the legislature and negotiating very closely with them because I think this is a day-to-day -day process. You cannot let it run and then try to catch up. You have to work on it every day. Mr. Rutherford. Kelly, just give you some concrete examples. I think it's, you know, rhetoric doesn't get the job done. When I was in Washington, I introduced a piece of legislation called the school construction bill. It took about 10 years, 12 years to get it finally through. They provided zero interest bonds for schools all across America. Every state got it. Every community had it. Bill schools, North Carolina got a half a billion dollars. 10,000 jobs were created from 09. It's still operating. Another one was the hometown heroes bill. It resulted from a fireman losing his life of a heart attack. And it says currently, if you lose your life of a heart attack or stroke in 24 hours after going off duty, you get a federal death benefit. It took them three years to get it passed. Republican House, Republican Senate, Republican White House. We organized every fire station, every police department in this country, got them engaged. Why is that important? Because just yesterday, a fireman who was 47 years old, lost his life, had a child who's 11 and 13. They now will get the death benefit because of that legislation. That's what doing it right. You do the right thing for the right reason. Good things happen, not only for the American people, for the people here in North Carolina. That's really what they want. They don't ask you for anything else. They ask you to do the right thing. Mr. Faison, 30 seconds. Well, you know, Bob, I don't know exactly what and how you did when you were in Washington. But when you were superintendent of public instruction, you got so sideways with the legislature, which was a democratic legislature, that they gutted the superintendent of public instruction office's power. In fact, I drafted legislation a couple of years ago trying to get the power back in there. So I don't know how you're going to work with a Republican legislature when you couldn't even get along with a Democratic one. Mr. Dalton, economic incentives sure make the headlines when companies choose to come here and when they choose not to come here based on the incentives package. And there's got many small business owners out there read about it in the paper and they say, hey, wait a minute, we don't get any break at all and we get to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. So what's the balance in offering economic incentives in North Carolina to bring jobs in? And if you're one of those non-qualifying small businesses reading about it, how should you feel about it? Well, you should not like it if you're a small business, and that's the reason I came forward with the proposal about the Small Business Assistance Fund to get them through the tough times, and we need to do as much as we can for small business. But the truth of the matter is, nobody likes incentives. There's no question about that. But every state offers them. This legislature tried to freeze economic development money. At the same time, the Republican governor of Virginia went to his legislature and said, I need $54 million to compete against China, India, and North Carolina. So it's part of the process. I've said it's like playing basketball and the coach says, I don't like the three-point rule. Don't count my shots. You're not going to win many games. Every other state is competing, so we have to do it. But we have to be responsible in the way we do it. What the incentives generally do, if a company comes in, and they're generic, any company that would do this in accordance with the legislation, as it's crafted, if they pay higher than the average wage, offer benefits, and invest a stated amount of money, then they will get a partial incentive to come in, but the state always nets out positive money, and we always get jobs out of that, and if they fail, then we have a clawback provision that brings that money back in. I don't know of anybody that likes incentives. I wish the federal government would hold that no state can offer them. And then you judge it on the thing that is truly valuable, and that is the quality of the workforce, the quality of the training that we have at our community colleges, the research that we do at our universities. But the truth of the matter is you have to have that tool in your toolbox today. Mr. Etheridge. Well, you're going to have that tool in your toolbox, but do we have a well-educated workforce? And the number of folks getting a good education, we're going to still struggle. We're going to still have to use that. Let me just remind you, that for a person with less than a high school education, they are three and a half times more likely to be unemployed in this economy. Those numbers are from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Anyone can check them. Than someone who has a college degree. 
even in a tough market. Now, as the market gets better, it may change. Yes, we're going to continue to need them. I wish we didn't. But I think what we really need is a jobs plan for every single county in North Carolina, not just a large one, not just those who have resources, but every county, because every county is different. If they develop the plan coordinated with the state, even for regional, I think we would see things happen. Then you start seeing the education piece undergird that, good things will happen because till you get education, you get that plan. I always like to work off a plan because the plan gives you something that's concrete that people can measure the success you've had rather than just words that aren't measurable. Mr. Faison. We need a new approach to incentives. Uh, I don't know whether you all know about these incentives, but what they do is they generally go to some out-of-state company and offer them one of two kinds of incentives. They offer them some others, but generally one of two kinds. Either they get to forego paying taxes for some period of time so long as they produce enough jobs, or they get a certain amount of money up front and over time. There's something called a clawback provision. What it says is if the company doesn't produce the jobs or if it closes up, then it owes the money back to the state. And that's used to try to go get businesses that are not here and bring them here. Well, what about the 155,000 small businesses who are already here? What are we doing for them? And the answer is almost nothing. We need to restructure our tax plan. We need to look at our incentives and look for incentives to help people at home. Why, do you know sometimes the state enters into contracts to be performed by companies out of state when the same work could be done right here at home? That's just not acceptable. We need to be looking after our own people, our own business, and providing incentives here to grow our jobs market. Mr. Etheridge, this May 2012 primary will let voters determine a marriage amendment to the North Carolina Constitution. It's decided, I don't think it'd be a general campaign issue, but it is an act of direct democracy versus a representative body casting that vote, standing right. behind it. When should leaders delegate a big decision to the voters directly? And when should they make the vote or stand behind the position and go back to the constituents and get the results? Well, Kelly, we currently have on the statute, in the statutes, a piece of legislation dealing with marriage as it's between a man and a woman. What we're talking about here, and I, again, I'm not an attorney, I'm a businessman. These two will have to answer the legal piece of it. It's really about, in my view, taking away, putting in our constitution something that takes away rights that's discriminatory. We don't normally do that. You know, that's just not the way North Carolina has been about, and historically we've not done that. And I don't think the Constitution ought to be used for that. And in that case, you know, for that reason, I've said we don't need it. I will not support it. It just should not be in our Constitution. Mr. Faison. Folks, we have two laws already in this state. One says marriage is between a man and the woman. The other says that North Carolina does not recognize same-gender unions performed out of state. Whether this constitutional amendment passes or fails doesn't change the law in North Carolina. If it passes, the law is the same thing it was the day before. If it fails, the law is still the same thing it was the day before. Well, why bother to put something in the Constitution? I mean, our Constitution is our fundamental rights and very, very special. And the answer to the question is, it's political gamesmanship on the part of the Republicans. They are trying to drive to the polls their most conservative base. It's a get out the vote effort for the Republicans. It's not about protecting marriage. That is the absolute thing it is not intended to do. You know, folks, I love my family and I support all families of all kinds. When this amendment came up on the floor of the House, knowing that it's nothing in the world but a get out the vote effort for the Republicans, I voted against it. And not only that, on May 8th, when I walk in that ballot box, I'm still going to vote against it because it is political boondoggling. It is not good legislation. It is not well-men-intended well legislation. It's just part of their radical agenda they're trying to run. Mr. Dalton. Kelly, quickly, just back one moment to small business. I will say small business likes big business. Bill mentioned my county. We have a billion dollars coming out of the ground with Facebook. It has put hundreds of workers to work 
in Rutherford County because of that construction. So th that is a compatible relationship. Now as to Amendment 1, Amendment 1 is a bad idea. Uh, it's going to uh, cost us jobs. It will not create jobs. It will cost us jobs. It is in conflict with some of the domestic violence laws that we have. It's going to foul up some of the insurance plans that are out there. And the most offensive thing about this is when they came into Raleigh, they said, we're going to work on job creation. And yet what they did is they worked on divisive social issues at a time when North Carolina needs to be coming together and working together. And in addition, I don't think there's any question if the amendment should pass, it will end up in the courts. There is already a, a state that is in the court system now. That case is probably headed to the Supreme Court. So North Carolina will be spending our tax dollars on that lawsuit rather than putting that into jobs. And on the, uh, if, if we pass it on our lawsuits, what I'm saying. So, you know, I think it's a very bad idea. Uh, they made a mistake in focusing on that rather than on jobs for North Carolina. Mr. Faison, this is a Democratic Party debate and all these debates and forums are for us to try to get you gentlemen to draw distinctions. Looking at your resume, what makes you uniquely different, uniquely different from Mr. Etheridge, Mr. Dalton? Well, to start with, I'm not a professional politician. Both of them are. Uh, they only work for the government. I am a citizen legislator. I grew up on a North Carolina family farm. Uh, I am a small businessman. I represent people who've been injured. I advocate and work for individual people, not for corporations. And I don't look for the government to provide my income. I get it somewhere else. And so when I come into this office to try and help you, I'm here for people. If you go back and look at my legislative record, my votes are for people against government. My votes are for people, not big business. Uh, my whole career has been aimed at trying to help my neighbors, our friends, and people across this state. And in that regard, I've been out for trying to protect your drinking water. I've been fighting for women and women's rights. I've been trying to keep these Republicans from gutting the Racial Justice Act and making it more difficult for African Americans to vote. I have been on the line fighting the Republicans. I've debated Pat McCrory. Neither of these guys have been around, not until they announced for governor that any of them have an idea or a plan for anything. None of them were there while we were fighting the fight. I'm the one you can depend on to get it done because I'm the one who's been getting it done. Mr. Dalton, what makes you different? Well, first of all, I would say that if Bill doesn't want to work for the government, he can drop out of the race because the governor works for the government. I was like him. I, I was a, a practicing attorney when I ran for lieutenant governor the last three years. I have been employed by the government, but I will tell you that that's what makes me uniquely different in that during those three years, I've been working first to help people through the tough times. In a time that the budget was down, able to get some money for a small business loan fund to help the small businesses weather the storm. Prior to that, passing a home protection program to responsibly help people save their homes from foreclosure, working with the banks to restructure the loans. While I have been Lieutenant Governor, I have worked as chair of the e-learning commission. Those are great people working on making technology a more important component in our education system. We have the second largest virtual public school in North Carolina, more online courses than any other state. I've been working on STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math, working with others to create a STEM learning network that will help the taxpayer dollar be used wisely, working on logistics, which is moving people and goods in the 21st century economy, looking at our roads and rail, and all of those are pointed to our future and to our economic betterment. That, I think, the experience and the vision and knowing the state of North Carolina as I do and talking to the people and knowing their needs. What sets you apart, Mr. Etheridge? Leadership. What the state needs is leadership, someone who can lead. I've had leadership skills from the county commissioner to a state legislator to superintendent of schools to Washington, held leadership spots and all those. I was in business for 19 years, ran businesses while I was doing those things. But the real key is, can you get things done? Can you work across party lines? Do you have the executive experience? I did as superintendent. Contrary to what Bill said, the one mistake I made was not entering that lawsuit bill that June Atkinson did, but I just didn't do it because I should have. But the truth is, I provided leadership there, provided leadership when the governor tapped me to help with 
the closing down the recovery office and the hurricanes, legislative experience in, in Washington and in Raleigh in getting things done. That's what the people want. You know, they don't want us to talk about it. Have, what have you done? Have you really been able to do something? You know, yes, I've been in the private sector and yes, I've been in the public sector as a public servant. But all those things are about taking good ideas, working with people across party lines, across ideology, but more importantly, leading the stake and taking the tough votes, like the health care vote, like the vote on the recovery package, doing the things that others took a walk from, standing up and being counted when you had to be counted to move forward. Thank you, gentlemen. That concludes the question portion of this debate. It's now time to move to closing arguments. We begin with Mr. Dalton. Kelly, thank you so much, and thank you in CTV, because this is an important election. North Carolina has always been a state of vision and opportunity, the first public university system, creating the best community college system, having the vision to, marriage, uh, to marry business and education with RTP. Now, Pat McCrory and the Republican leadership are trying to move North Carolina backwards. They're cutting education, they're cutting financial aid, depriving many students of that opportunity that they deserve. I want North Carolina to move forward. I understand the importance of innovation, and I will never rely on tired solutions of the past. I am the candidate with the knowledge, the experience, the vision, and the ability to beat Pat McCrory, but more than that, I'm the one that can move North Carolina forward. Thank you, Kelly. Mr. Fazer. Folks, thank you for letting me come into your home and talk with you tonight. I want you to go look at my website. It's BillFason.com. You'll see the jobs plan there. You'll see an energy plan there. And you'll see an education plan there. Not only that, you'll see the debate I've already had with Pat McCrory. Now, we all know he's going to be the nominee this fall. We need a champion and a standard bearer who not only has proven leadership, who not only has vision and practical solutions to the problems, all of which I offer you, but someone who can handle the fight, who can get up in front of the public, who can communicate, and who can express the ideas that really matter. I can do that. With your help, I'll be our governor. I'm Bill Faison. I want your help, I want your support, and I want your vote. Mr. Etheridge. Kelly, thank you. Let me thank folks for tuning in. You know, tonight we've talked about a lot of issues. Issues of the economy, issues of education, and really about jobs, too. And we also talked about the environment. But what we're really talking about tonight is leadership. Who can provide the leadership? Number one, who can win in, on May 8th? But more importantly, who can lead this state forward and take on Pat McCroy? You know, the, the Republicans in the General Assembly, uh, you know, said they were for a bunch of things. But what did they do? They came in, they cut education, they cut all those things that North Carolinians historically have cared about. And I'm here to tell you, leadership will get us beyond this. I am the person who can provide that leadership. I ask for your vote on early vote this week. And every day that you go vote between now and May 8th, but on May 8th, and I promise you, we will whip Pat McCoy come November, and we'll move North Carolina forward to a brighter day. Thank you. That concludes our Democratic gubernatorial candidates debate. For more information on this program and other election 2012 information, please visit our online election website at unctv.org slash election. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.